This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Fewer ministers and more women. Ethiopia's new cabinet unveiled and takes oath of office. Killed by those who are supposed to work for peace. Victims' families call for justice in the Central African Republic. The killed are relatives, but the process is carried out behind closed doors? No. We reject that process and we demand a new trial. A faction of the Islamist group Boko Haram executes a second aid worker in northern Nigeria. Also in the program, exploring the trafficking trap. Please, this job is too hard for me to do. I don't want to do this job. Please, ma, any other job. The film is called Joy, the story behind Nigerian sex workers in Europe who find themselves exploited at home and abroad. I'm really glad that the movie is out, someone is telling the story, and that I hope that it helps other women, you know, at least for someone to make a change. And in sports, Madagascar make history by qualifying for the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations for the very first time. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. More women, fewer posts. That's what Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has unveiled in a new cabinet and told Parliament the decisions were based on the competence of his staff. 50-50, the new team, which is much leaner, is responsible for managing government departments like transport, trade and tourism, and they are split 50-50 men to women. Now, Defence Minister Aisha Mohammed is one of the most senior roles. She will be in charge of Ethiopia's defence budget. Cabinet cut from 28 to 20. There will be a fewer cabinet posts overall as the Prime Minister cut the number of roles from 28 to 20. Now, President Abiy uh, says in a, in, in a message, he dis disproves the old adage that uh, women cannot lead. Today, he told Parliament, our women ministers will disprove that uh, saying. Well, let's go uh, get a little bit more on uh, that development. And Sedale Lema is uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, the Addis uh, uh, Standard. He, she's been following uh, that development for us. Thanks for taking time to talk to us. Um, two very major things have happened in this uh, cabinet reshuffle. We've had a reduction in the cabinet ministers and we've also seen uh, more women now in cabinet. Are you surprised by this move? Well, I'm not surprised by the first one, uh, which is the slashing of the number of cabinets, um, because they have been announcing it for the last few weeks. But uh, I must say I'm surprised by the number of uh, female cabinets that have uh, been announced today. That's a 50-50. Uh, this I do not expect it. But does this, though, uh, take care of the structure, the policy structures that uh, an agenda that the Prime Minister has now? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Does this fall into place with the agenda that the Prime Minister has now? Yeah, the Prime Minister made it clear this morning in the Parliament that uh, his decision to both slash and also add more female cabinet ministers uh, is based on his uh, wish to continue with the reform agenda. And looking at the, the number of uh, women uh, cabinet ministers and also the fresh faces that uh, he brought up to, the, to four, um, it's, um, it's likely that uh, his, his reform agenda will be carried um, along with, with these assignments. Yeah, some of these women who've been appointed have also uh, had different portfolios. How have they done in those uh, other portfolios? Well, uh, I think the major one is uh, Mufrat Kamil, who's, who's also the chairwoman of the Southern Ethiopian uh, People Democratic uh, Movement. And she has been a very formidable politician in the past and uh, a fast rising one through the ranks. Uh, so I think, and, and she's now carrying quite a lot of responsibilities as the uh, Minister for Peace, which is a new portfolio that's mm. created by the Prime Minister. So I, I am quite hopeful. Uh, also for the others is the same. Doug Moit, for example, the Deputy Mayor, uh, has been very uh, forthcoming in her achievements uh, in the last few months as, as a Deputy Mayor in Addis Ababa. Uh, so I, I am very confident that uh, these women add up to um, a lot of values to, to the Prime Minister's agenda of reform. 
Sadale, reducing a cabinet is uh, seen by many as quite a huge and, and a step of confidence, so to speak. Um, can we say today that uh, the Prime Minister has no trouble within his administration? Well, I think uh, they understand uh, to, to a certain extent that the number of ministerial portfolios in the country has been quite a burden because many of them have not been delivering in the past. And he made it clear this morning as well the reason why he has to slash down. And slashing is not really some of them uh, is not quite cutting them off, but it's just rather merging them. Uh, for example, the Ministry of Trade with the Ministry of Industry, which share, both of them share quite an, a lot of similarities in their activities. So um, I don't think he will face a lot of problems in this regard. So then we have a new ministry then, which has been created, the Ministry of Peace. What specifically will uh, whoever has been appointed, which is a lady, of course, what will she be doing really? Well, I, I think the responsibility that she's be carrying uh, is quite a lot. Uh, I, it, she will be overseeing the National Intelligence and Security Service, for example, and also the uh, Information Network Security Agency, which are two big institutions when it comes to intelligence infrastructure within the EPRDF. Uh, but also there are other agencies that are that have been made into uh, accountable to to her Ministry of Peace. So this is quite quite um, a long list of, uh, of responsibilities, but. Uh, Seeing where she's coming from, uh, many people are very hopeful that uh, she might be, um, she's capable of conducting this assignment. But some are also expressing concern that it's just too huge a responsibility for one woman to carry. All, all right. Well, we'll, of course, be watching uh, developments there in Ethiopia. Thank you very much indeed for taking time to talk to us. Sedali Lema, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's now take a look at other stories making headlines across Africa. Six people have been killed and 86 others injured after a train derailed near the Moroccan capital. It came off the tracks 20 kilometers north of Rabat between the towns of Kenitra and Salim. An investigation is underway. King Mohammed Said said he will pay the burial costs of the victims and for treatment of the injured. Levels of hunger in the Democratic Republic of Congo have more than doubled since last year. That's according to a new report by the Wild Food Programme, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Ministry of Agriculture. More than 13 million people, nearly one-fifth of the population, are said to be without enough food. Now, nearly half of them, are, half of the children under the age of five, are reportedly suffering from malnutrition. Uh, staying in the DRC and the United Nations has stopped military operations in some eastern areas because of the risk from Ebola is too high. Ongoing conflict in the area of the outbreak is also making the response particularly difficult. Now, the World Health Organization will convene an emergency meeting on Wednesday to determine whether the outbreak constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Madagascar's government has publicly destroyed a cache of illegal guns and rifles that were handed in by civilians as part of an amnesty month organized by the African Union. Now, the organization wants to end the personal possession of weapons by 2020. In total, 846 guns and rifles were crushed and rendered unusable. Now, in 2014, 13 people, women, men and young children, were shot dead in cold blood by peacekeepers serving in the Central African Republic. Human Rights Watch describes this as one of the worst massacres by peacekeepers in Africa. Now, families of the victims are calling for justice after three soldiers convicted for most of the murders were sentenced to three years in jail. Catherine Biaruhanga reports from the CAR. This is where peacekeepers from Congo Brazzaville began their bloody revenge after their colleague was killed. A self-styled general with a Christian anti-Balaka militia was their target. But no one, not even children, was spared. Robert Kolofio came looking for his brother, General Morris. Instead, he found a boy, shot dead. I arrived after they took my brother. I went inside the compound and found traces of the murder of the child. 
he was laying outside there and his face was completely broken. So I went inside the room and found the clothes on the floor and the bed where the general used to sleep was empty. No one was around. Several people, including Morris, were taken from this house. In the town, an innocent bystander was also picked up. Earlier that day, he called me and told me he's coming to Boali for shopping. At 4 p.m. when the incident happened, we all ran away. He didn't know about it. He arrived and parked his motorcycle right here and was sitting on it when the Miska pointed the guns towards him and took him in their car. No one taken that day would ever be seen alive again. These were killings that might have remained hidden, were it not for a chance encounter. Human Rights Watch was coming through the town and we stopped to get a coffee. And uh, a contact actually of one of our local staffers just walked up and said, hey, do you know uh, like a dozen people, a dozen people, which includes some women and children, were taken by the AU forces. It was to be the start of a long and painstaking investigation that had to deal with misinformation from the beginning. At the time, the African Union said the peacekeepers had killed a dozen militia in self-defense. But Human Rights Watch investigators found out that the people arrested had been taken to the Congolese commander's home to the left. This is where they were shot in cold blood before being buried in a mass grave close to the African Union peacekeeping base. There is this notion that you can come to the Central African Republic as an international peacekeeper and you can get away with murder. Um, and that is, you know, by us continuing to work on this specific case, we're trying to, we're trying to, you know, let people know that they will actually be held accountable for their actions if they do commit these types of crimes. In April this year, three soldiers were convicted of murdering 11 of the 13 people killed. For war crimes, they were sentenced to just three years in prison. They've already been freed for time served. The families of the victims had no idea the trial was even happening. Priska and the other relatives of those killed are now pushing for a civil case, hoping they finally get the justice they believe they deserve. Catherine Biarahanga, BBC News, Bowali in the Central African Republic. Well, uh, let's uh, bring you a development that's been a talking point in Nigeria today. An aid worker with the International Committee of the Red Cross has been killed by Islamist militants who kidnapped her last March. Hawa Liman was working as a midwife with internally displaced people in the north of the country. Her killing follows the execution of another abducted health worker last month. There had been widespread appeals for the release of the abductees, including a schoolgirl. A video clip of the killing of Hawa Liman was seen by a local Nigerian reporter who described how she was forced to kneel down with her hands tied inside a white hijab and then shot at close range. Well, let's bring in uh, Patricia Danzi. She is the regional director for Africa at the International Committee of the Red Cross. She joins us from Geneva. Thanks for taking time to talk to us. Uh, quite a disturbing moment for you at this time. But what was the government's response? Because we know you approached the government in Nigeria uh, for uh, some sort of intervention. Well, when we received the news um, and when we received the threat, especially last the Saturday, uh, we have made this large plea and we plead for everyone that has a stake to make something to avert this situation from happening. Now, with the government of Nigeria, because uh, Hawa and Saifura, they are Nigerian citizens. So since the beginning of the abduction, we are in close contact with the Nigerian government uh, to make sure that we can do everything that we can possibly can do together to um, to have their release um, secured. Did it look like they made an effort at all to to secure her release? Are you confident? They all made, 
we, we all made huge efforts to to um, to have the two healthcare workers safely back with their families. Uh, these two have worked in Ram, which is a, it's an area outside of Maiduguri. They have left the comfort of their of their city. They have left their families to provide much needed healthcare to the to the communities of Ram. So they deserve their unconditional release. Uh, the plea and all the efforts uh, seem to be have been in, in, in vain and we are very devastated by by the news. So it's such, such devastation but has there been any impact on your work on the ground since their abduction uh, in March? You know if you if you look at northern Nigeria and if you look at the health system for instance we had uh, about a decade ago we had 700 health clinics uh, today we have less than 400 so the 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 impact of the of the war is felt by the communities it's felt by the internally displaced and it's people like Hawa and Saifura that can make a difference to the communities. So war always has an impact on people and most uh, of the ones that suffer are the ones that have no stake. Um, they are innocent, uh, of either healthcare workers or um, of the victims. Right, so uh, just very quickly, what do you specifically do in terms of uh, helping um, the aid workers or really determining whether areas are risky? How do you train them? How do you determine when to change a plan? Well, before we work in an area, we make sure that we are accepted. We are accepted by the communities. We talk to leaders. We talk to to to, to different stakeholders at uh, in a different area. We talk to the government and we seek guarantees, security guarantees that we can work. Um, this is sometimes very difficult in areas where the groups or groups don't accept us because of the fact that we are from an international organization or for other uh, reasons. Yes, criminality can sometimes also be an issue. Uh, it's currently, for instance, a case in the Central African uh, Republic where criminality hampers part of the work of the humanitarians. But All the right. reasons can, be, can, be, uh, can, can vary a lot. All right, uh, Patricia Danzi, thank you very much indeed for taking time to talk to us and focus on Africa. Well, let's get the government reaction now because our correspondent in Abuja, Ishak Khalid, has been speaking to the presidential spokesperson, Garba Shehu. So what did her father tell President Muhammad Buhari? Well, he, he said that he had accepted this as, a, as, a, as coming from God Almighty and there was nothing that... Uh, could have stopped her death. Of course, this is, you know, your typical Muslim attitude to these things. Uh, but the president's assurance was that the Nigerian government, uh, using some of our contacts abroad, international partners and some countries, we did everything that anyone could do to save her life. Unfortunately, apparently, they were bent on just carrying out this execution. Nigerian uh, presidential spokesperson there, Garba Shehu. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Sophie Ikenye. Still to come, World Athletics ruling body, the IAAF, says it will postpone the implementation of controversial new rules on the high testosterone levels in female athletes. Peter will be here with the details. You're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program. The Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, has named a new cabinet in which half of the ministers are women. Mr. Ahmed said the appointment of more women would help in the fight against corruption. And the second aid worker is killed by a faction of the Islamic militant group Boko Haram in northern Nigeria. Let's now find out what's happening in the world of sport. Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. And there's only one place to start, and that's with the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers. There were 21 games in all today. Madagascar clinched a historic place in the finals with a 1-0 win over Equatorial Guinea. And they celebrated with an Icelandic clap, or maybe a, a Malagasy clap. 26-year-old Thailand-based midfielder Njiva Rakatoharamala he scored the only goal of the game just before halftime to send the Malagasy into their first ever Nations Cup. Now, Senegal will also secure a place amongst the 24 finalists if they defeat pointless Sudan in Khartoum in their Group A match. That game is about uh, 18 minutes old and the score there is still nil-nil. Morocco are making a big meal of their qualification after they were held to a two-all draw away to the Comoros Islands. It means the Atlas Lions will have to wait till match day five 
to hopefully qualify. Cameroon, who have already qualified as hosts, were held nil-nil in Malawi. In Group J, Egypt beat Iswatini 2-0 in Mbabane. And with Tunisia beating Niger 2-1 in Niamey, it means the two North African teams have qualified. In Group H, Ivory Coast were held to a nil-nil draw by the Central African Republic. And in Group L, Tanzania beat Cape Verde 2-0 to move them into second place in that group. Cape Verde are not out of it, though, and could still qualify. Uganda will remain in pole position if they can hold on to this re, uh, the, the score so far. They're up against Lesotho. They're currently leading 2-0. And anywhere you see an L in these tables, it means the games are still going on or are yet to start. Remember, all the results from all the games, as well as the tables and the permutations, are on our website, bbc.com slash African football. Finally, World Athletics ruling body, the IAAF, has announced it will postpone the implementation of controversial new rules on high testosterone levels in female athletes. It follows a case brought by South African track star Casta Semenya challenging their legality. The body had scheduled November 1 as the date they wanted to introduce the rules that have split opinion amongst many female athletes. Some welcome the new rules as a way to create a fairer playing field, while others, such as Semenya, argue it is discriminatory. Whew, got through that. That's just what <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Well... We'll end the program with an issue we've covered extensively on this program, the plight of African migrants making the journey to Europe. It's a subject of a new movie that is screening at the London Film Festival. Joy looks at the challenges Nigerian women face once they arrive in Europe. Victoria Owonghunda met the lead actress Joy Alphonses and asked her how the director helped her prepare for her role. It felt so natural, like it was so real and natural for me because I didn't have to rehearse or to, to plan it before. Then she tells me and for me, it's, I try to just do it, you know, and she likes it. And if there are any corrections, she just add it and then you do like fury takes and that it is. So it was easier for me. You're playing a character that has a young child that is left back home in Nigeria. You are a mother of two little girls. How much of yourself and the experience and emotions did you bring to the character Joy in the film? It was a lot of emotional attacks for me. It was at some point very hard, really, I have to be honest. Because the story itself is a very emotional story, so at some point it was really hard. But, yeah, I, I, I put in my best and then, yeah, we made it work. It's a movie that tackles such a serious issue, human trafficking, migration, you see people dying on the shores of Europe, coming from the continent. But yet you see some kind of light moments when Joy, the character that you play, is training Precious, the young girl, but you see them playing and putting on clothes, dancing to the music, trying on wigs in a hair saloon. What was it like being with that group of other women working and playing together? It was very fun and we really enjoyed it. It made me remember at home because back in Nigeria, like in my home country, that's similar. We have a very big community. The family, friends are always around. The big house, the big, you know, home and everywhere is full. It, it was like a, a new but fulfilling experience for us. It was really fun. And I'm really glad that the movie is out. Someone is telling the story and that it's hope that it helps other women, you know, at least for someone to make a change. Joy. Well, don't forget, of course, you can catch up with uh, other news making headlines across the continent on our website. That's uh, bbc.com forward slash Africa. You can also catch up with me. I'm on Twitter at Sikenye. That's all from the program from me and the rest of the Focus on Africa team. Thanks for your company. Bye-bye.